Hello, and welcome to Elm Street Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. We're glad you've chosen to join us today as we worship the Lord together in the house of God. Today, as we worship, I want to encourage you to think about the incredible majesty of God as the creator of everything. He's the giver of life and the reason we have breath to live another day. For those of you watching our service on Facebook, welcome. We're glad you've joined us. Please sign in on the comment section, and if you have a prayer request or need to be contacted, let us know there as well. And I do have a few announcements. I'm going to move this, sorry. Prayer meeting is on Zoom every Wednesday night at 7. If you need the link, please ask Pastor Kathy. So that means we probably won't have one this week. Right. Because she's gone. Okay. Mission of the month is strengthen the church. That is one of the UCC wider uh, missions. The way, our origins of Christianity as viewed by the early disciples. This will be led by Marcy on Zoom, Thursday evenings at 7, and this will start July 11th. And if you need a link for that, see Marcy. August 8th, the book study will resume at 1030 in the conference room. And let's see, we'll be reading Jonathan Livingston Siegel by Richard Bach. Copies of the book can be picked up in the church office beginning on July 16th. We'll meet at 1030 in the church conference room. And in researching the book, Llewellyn found the following message that spoke to her as the lessons we can learn from it. Though a simple read, which was why I picked it in the first place, this novella is packed with many life's lessons that we can adopt for ourselves. It teaches the value of purpose and the importance of living a meaningful life. Like Jonathan, we all possess an innate potential that is often obscured by the mundane pursuits we have grown to mindlessly engage in as individuals and as a society. So hopefully many of you can join in on that. And then also um, at St. Luke's Guest House, we're looking for people to answer the phone. Um, right now, there's only two part-time staff people there. So we thought if we could get somebody to answer the phone, either one day a week, two, whatever, from eight to four, um, that would be wonderful. And we'll provide training and assistance. So just see me after church if interested. And Pastor Kathy is on vacation from June 24th to July 8th. And I'm available for emergencies. Okay. Call office or um, myself. Okay. Any other announcements? Okay, we'll start with our morning prelude. In our call to worship, please join me in the bold printed statements. Lord, open our hearts this morning to hear your words of compassion. Lord, help us to truly listen to you. Lord, open our spirits this morning to strengthen our faith. Lord, help us to work for you. Lord, make us ready to serve. 
Lord, make us ready to witness to your healing love. Amen. And let us pray. Lord of mercy and compassion, be with us this day as we hear of the healing love of Jesus. Remind us that we are also recipients of his compassion, and we are called to bring the same hope and love to others. Prepare us for service in Jesus' name. Amen. And our opening hymn is in your blue hymn books. It is actually 480. Open my eyes that I may see. And please stand if you're able. Because of such great mercy, God is ready to forgive all the ways we fail to live in faithfulness. Relying on that mercy, let us confess our transgressions before God and one another. Please join me in the confession. Patient Lord, you know us so well. We are fascinated by healing and can talk all day about the miracles, but we do not understand the compassion of Christ. We often say, just heal us, or just make me rich, or just make things go better at work, or other such deals, and then we promise our faithfulness and witness. But in our hearts, we just don't get it. Please forgive us, Lord, when our greed and fear get in the way of understanding. Help us to know the transformational power of your love. Get us ready to be faithful witnesses to you in all that we say and do. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. 
our God is a holy and loving God. He sent his only son to die on the cross for us so that all sins and transgressions would be wiped out. Do not be wary, do not be concerned. You are forgiven in the name of Christ. Amen. Holy and loving God, you have given us much and expect so little. We ask that you take what we give and let it bring healing and hope to all who need it. Amen. We'll now receive our morning offering. together. Holy, Holy God, God, we praise you that all things which come to us are yours. We are thankful that you provide for us financially, spiritually, and so many other ways. We cannot begin to list the ways you bless us. We know you don't need anything material from us, but you desire our hearts. And so, blessed Lord, we give you our tithes and offerings now but more, more importantly, importantly we, we give you our hearts and our love. Amen. Our morning scripture reading is from Mark chapter 5, verses 35 to 43. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Now join me in the Gloria Patri.
Holy God, by the power of your spirit, speak your word to us, O God. Show us who you are and who you are calling us to be for the sake of your Son and our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. And our sermon hymn is in your blue hymn books, number 134, Sweet, Sweet Spirit, and you may remain sitting. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to be here with you this morning on this very muggy, hot day, but it's not too bad in here. Not too bad. So the scripture reading this morning, it actually comes right after, I'm gonna paint the picture and tell you the story. So this scripture comes more at the end of Jesus's day. So Jesus has been at the Sea of Galilee, and he has been walking around the people on one side of the Sea of Galilee, um, which is the non-Jewish side. And he's been walking around and preaching and teaching the word about the kingdom of heaven. And many, and he has healed many people, and he's had a, a really full day. He's been going since probably sunset. And Jesus is doing all of these things and he's drawing crowds of people to him. And they're following him, they're grabbing at him. You know, it's, it's ah, I can't imagine what Jesus' schedule looked like. If we look at our own, I don't think it could ever compare to Jesus' schedule, especially on this day. So in order for Jesus um, to kind of get away from the people a little bit, he takes a boat and he goes in the middle of the lake and says, all right, all right, I'm going to preach from the middle of the lake so everyone can hear me through the echoes that are going out on the lake. So after he does that, probably for two hours, I'm guessing, I'm not sure, 
He rows his boat and he goes over to the other side of the lake. And when he reaches the other side of the lake, that is the Jewish side. And it's in a village called Capernaum. Um, and so he gets over to the other side and he is, pre-story is that Jairus, who was in our text this morning, is, is going right over to Jesus and pleading with Jesus to heal his daughter who is dying. And so Jesus says, let's go. Doesn't even hesitate. He says, let's go. And on the way, um, and this story will be familiar to you, is the story of the woman who um, had bled for a really long time, and she had just had faith enough to touch Jesus' cloak or his clothes, and she was instantly healed right away. But that kind of held Jairus up a little bit. It kind of held Jesus up a little bit. But that's okay. Jesus felt the power and energy drain from him, and we all know what that feels like. He had a hard day, and the Holy Spirit's power is strong in Christ, but he could feel some of it move and flow as this woman was healed. So Jesus, I can imagine, is trying to gain his equilibrium. He's trying to be like, okay, wh where were we off to? Um, and so they did set out for Jairus' house, but by the time they got there, Jairus' daughter seemingly appeared to be dead because it had taken a while for Jesus to get there. But that didn't stop Jesus. Jesus went into Jairus's house and he told the little girl of 12 to get up. But in the meantime, he's telling people, he's seeing mourners, he's seeing people crying as we all do when someone passes away, mourners, and he's saying, what are you crying for? What, why are you weeping? Why are you wailing? She's alive. She's just sleeping. Which is an interesting statement from Jesus. But it also shows us what Jesus is about to do. So Jesus goes in, and through his voice of command and his healing hands, he touches the little girl and tells her to get up. Sure enough, that little 12-year-old girl gets right up out of bed. She's probably dancing. She's, she might be a little bewildered. And yet, she lives. She lives. And what does Jesus say to, say to the family? Oh, just get her something to eat. Don't tell anybody I did this. Just go get her something to eat. It's all good. I love Christ, and I love his vagueness. You know, whether we're looking at parables, whether we're looking at things, um, scripture readings in our sacred text, Jesus seems very mysterious a lot of the time. Like, well, what do you mean just get something to eat? If that were me, and probably if that were you, we would be like, what just happened here? If we knew it was Christ, we'd be on our knees thanking him, right? And Jesus is like dusting off his robes, and he's like, she's healed. Now, the story for today is not about faith healing, and I know that that can be <laughs> a little confusing from what we're talking about in the scripture, um, and also by the title of the sermon, which is Believing is Healing. But it's not about faith healing. What we're going to look at this morning is the scripture that we read about Jairus. Oftentimes, we, we tend to look at the story of the bleeding woman, or we often tend to um, correlate the two together and study the two together. But today's focus, I really want to look at Jairus. So who is Jairus? What was Jesus' relationship to him that Jesus would just drop everything and go to a Pharisee's house or a leader of the synagogue's house? 
So Jairus was a ruler in the synagogue. He was a well-known religious leader in all that area. He was the one that would preach, he would um, teach lessons, he would read the Old Testament from the scrolls, he would set up the candles, he would um, get everything prepared for worship, he would counsel, he would, he would guide. Wait a minute. We often look back and we say, but Jesus didn't like the Pharisees. What made him do this? Hmm. But I would ask you to challenge that thought. Did you, Jesus really dislike the Pharisees? Or was he trying to add um, spirit to their lives? a deeper understanding of God than what they were seeing, perhaps some reconciliation to God and some healing. And so oftentimes we confuse Jesus' relationship with the Pharisees because the scripture tells us that Jesus goes in and says, woe to you. Or Jesus is constantly in a way, I think we might picture it as arguing back and forth. They're always grilling him and questioning him, leading up until his death. But yet, he drops everything to go to this house. Huh. Now, we know most of Jairus' friends um, are opposed to Jesus at this time. They see him healing on the Sabbath, they see him talking about things that they don't understand, a new way, a radical way. They see crowds following him. They see people raised from the dead. They see all kinds of things, demons um, being cast out of folks, and they're like afraid of him. They are so afraid of him. They don't show it in our ancient texts but I truly believe that they were afraid because Jesus shook things up and he shook up the status quo. And so, so the Pharisees really weren't for Jesus at that time, and yet here's one. Here's one. There were some Jewish leaders in the faith willing to consider Jesus' teachings, and in this text, Jairus is considering what he's going to do. He's desperate. His daughter is dying. He found himself willing and able to ask Christ. And it wasn't just an offhand, will you heal my, my daughter? It was, he stopped Jesus as soon as Jesus arrived. He waited for Jesus. He begged Jesus. He knew Jesus' power. Somehow, deep inside, he recognized Jesus for the power he had, for the authority that he had, and believed. Now, Jairus knew his friends probably wouldn't like that. Right? And Jairus doesn't ask any of these things in private. Jairus asks Jesus all of these things in the middle of throngs of people and in front of other Jewish folks, Jewish leaders. And Jairus disregards what others will think of him, totally disregards it. But Jesus has care for our needs. This girl was young, age of 12. We think about that. and We think about people that have passed away young and that it's such a tragedy. And Jesus wanted to prevent this tragedy. You see, she had her whole life ahead of her. It shows Jesus' heart at the time. She had her whole life ahead of her. She was almost of marrying age. She was from a wealthy, powerful family. She would, have, would live on to tell Jesus' story 
and so would Jairus. So let me, so as Jesus is encountering the woman in the crowd, if we look at the two just for a minute, the woman in the crowd that Jesus encountered on his way to Jairus' house was an outcast. Why? According to Jewish law and tradition, anyone who was bleeding was unclean. Couldn't touch her, couldn't go near her, because she constantly bled, she was ostracized. She was put somewhere in um, a community that she would not be, no one would be able to touch her. She was isolated from the word of God. She was isolated from others. And so, but then, on the other hand, we have Jairus from this powerful family. So it shows that Jesus is healing the outcasts. He's responding to both of their faith. He's dealing with, he's crossing gender boundaries by healing a woman. He's crossing, and even speaking to her, he is crossing political boundaries because Jairus was of the political way because the synagogue rulers were at the time. He was crossing financial barriers. He was willing to heal the wealthy as well as the poor. We oftentimes preach that Jesus is only concerned with the poor. But guess what? God loves everybody. And Jesus shows God's love through this act. And he had a willingness to do both. He didn't yell at the woman when she touched his clothes. And he certainly didn't yell at Jairus or tell him no. You see, Jesus doesn't favor anyone over anyone else, which is kind of a relief. If you think about it, we're all created, we're all loved, we're all forgiven, and no one is better than anyone else. And that is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. I don't know about you, but sometimes some of that pressure just breathes right out of me when I think of that. Like, okay, oh, it's okay. It's okay to have money as long as you love God. Of course, Jesus always says, keep this a secret, keep this a secret, but, you know, we know how well that works. <laughs> that didn't work well at all. It showed that everyone can come to Jesus. And I'm sure Jesus knew that there would be, you know, we're all human. I know Jesus must have known. Even though he said it a million times, don't tell anybody what I just did, I'm sure he knows that there would be local gossip, stories, they were big storytellers at that time, you know, and I'm sure Jesus knew that that word would get back, showing that it doesn't matter who you are, I'm willing to help you, heal you, if you believe. Believe in me, believe in the love of God. Now when Jesus says, get this girl something to eat, and shakes off his robe, What's that about? Jesus isn't just concerned with the body. He's concerned with the spirit. He's concerned with the soul. Get someone something to eat and drink. He just healed her spirit, brought her soul back to her body and now he wants to feed her. He knows she's clothed, but he wants to feed her. What love is that? Get her something to eat. So what can we take, a, take away from all this? Jesus grants life-changing healing. 
And it isn't always of the faith healing kind with the body. It is healing and transcendence. It is renewal. It is unity. It is grace. It is reconciliation. It is all about everything being in balance. Soul, body, spirit, God. All about balance. Jesus has said he has the power to alter conditions. I can alter these conditions. This girl is dying, I can change that. I can cross political boundaries. I can cross gender boundaries. I can. Do we? Jesus gave us all power and authority under him as future disciples, gave his disciples the same authority. Guess what? We can. We can. Can we alter the conditions of people's lives like Jesus did? Bringing healing, a little heart, some kindness, a smile. You see, it's not always the big things. Sometimes it's the little things. Can Jesus bring healing to troubled circumstances? Yes, absolutely. But oftentimes we are distracted, we are, you know, swept up. We are hearing all kinds of truths that we don't always or we're not always able to focus on the truth. We are human. And so sometimes we have to work a little bit in order to hear the truth and know the truth and live the truth. We have to focus. We can cross boundaries too. We can. We can talk about anything. We can with love as Jesus did. We can advocate. We can give meaning to people's lives. And that brings change. And it brings everything Jesus brings. Renewal, hope, restoration, love, unity, transcendence. But we have to have faith and courage to do so. And oftentimes that's hard to find. Because we're often the opposite of Jairus. We're often like, all right, I want to talk to this person, or I want to say this, but my friends over here are saying something else. Or, hmm, my friends are gossiping, so I'm going to gossip too. Or, ooh, those folks will be really mad at me if, if I, you know, speak the truth or, or do something. We are stuck sometimes where it's really hard. Having courage is, is a hard thing, and yet we can't find that courage unless we turn to Christ, unless we see the beauty of his life, unless we too seek unity restoration, reconciliation. We can do anything that we need to do. We just have to have faith. And then others will trust us and believe in us too. Why? Because they recognize the language of love. They recognize the language of love. It's in all of us. So when someone recognize that, recognizes that, or kindness, or if you stand up for someone, even sometimes if you're alone in that, Jesus smiles upon you, God smiles upon you, but you also have someone else whose life you changed, and you don't even know it sometimes. It's about boldness. It's about belief. And so we can bring these things into our lives. Again, I think we need to focus on Jesus, Christ, 
as our example and know that we too are empowered. So if something is on your heart, if you feel like you need to help someone or, or are drawn to a particular ministry, I would encourage you to do it. Don't worry about what your friends think. Don't worry about who's doing it. I can tell you it's hard to stand alone, but sometimes you have to stand alone for what's right. But you're never alone. God is always with you. The Spirit is always encouraging you. And Jesus remains right here. And so that's what I leave you with today. God bless you and, and reflect on that this week. Amen. And so we've come to our time of joys and concerns. Let's start with joys. Please tell me someone has a joy. We are here this morning. We are together. We are loved. That's a joy. I'll share that joy. All right. Concerns. Anyone to pray for? Anyone we should be thinking about this morning? Prayers for Jeff's son, John. Healing prayers for um, Alessandro. What was her Karen. first? Karen Alessandro. Okay. Yep. Continued prayers for Lem Walker, um, that God will be with him and grant him with grace and peace, comfort and consolation, be with um, uh, Carol, and, uh, Carol and Fred, be with Karen Horton, um, healing for Karen Horton, healing for, who am I leaving out? Help me out. Gloria Kerboy, I'm into that. Um, Ann and Jack Shaw. Yeah. Anyone else? All who need healing? And Amy Hendrick want, wants us to pray for all who need healing today. Um, I would like to add prayers for whoever is on the other end of that fire truck and ambulance that went by this morning. Um, pray for safety and for the firefighters as well as the families um, or family. Sue? So. Prayers for David Bond. Um, prayers for David and, David and Sharon Bond. David um, had to go to the hospital um, with, with a heart condition, heart issues, and had to have stints put in. Um, and so we, we pray for Sharon and David. Anyone else? Yeah. Prayers for the retired um, chief of Millbury um, and all of his brothers, and as well as his family.
prayers for those who suffer from mental illness, oh, prayers for those who are affected by it. And may healing occur as well as um, coming to senses in order to um, get healing, get healing. Amen. Okay. Let us pray together. But first, let's have silent prayer and reflection. Holy and loving God, we ask you to lift up those that we mentioned today. We pray, Lord, for safety, love, healing, hope. We pray that anything within us that holds us back, um, that we will release in order to do your work or do it better. We ask that you be with those who cannot be with us today. We ask that you be with Pastor Kathy and Greg. We ask, Lord, that you'll be with our church and its people, our community, our leaders. Be with all of us, Lord. We ask that your healing power through believing will touch us, not just today, but always. Strengthen us and help us through Help us to have boldness and courage and strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Join me in the bold print for our intercessory prayers. Lord, you know how great our needs are. In these difficult times when jobs are threatened, homes are being lost, families are experiencing great stress. Lord, come and bring your healing love. Help us to place our trust in you. Remind us again of how you transform lives, not just with healing, but with a spirit of hope and compassion. Lord, come and bring your healing hope. Teach us not to give up when things are going wrong. Give us faith that can move mountains. Lord, come and bring your healing faith. Give us hearts that are ready to be of service to others in all times and in all places. Remind us that your healing hand rests on those who need you and us also. Lord, come and strengthen our hearts. Help all to be people of compassion and trust as you are, Lord. Lord, come and bring your healing love. Amen. And join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is in the blue hymnal, number 444, Rain Down.
May you feel the power of Christ's healing love restoring you. Go in peace, offering help and hope to others. <coughs> and may the peace of God always be with you. Amen. <coughs> Join us in the threefold amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.